for good or ill, men have landed on the moon, and those rocks on the sea of tranquility are only the stepping stones to yet more fantastic and more expensive ventures into the unknown. Heroic? Historic? Yes. But is it worth it? James Mossman. Well, lady and gentlemen, we'll go into what Thomas Paine was saying later and take up some of those points. First, can I have an immediate reaction from all of you? When you saw those two spacemen walking and kicking about and jumping about in the dust on the moon, what was your real considered and authentic reaction? Lady Jackson. Well, it seemed to me that it's possible that man has a destiny that goes outside this planet and that this is the first sign of him beginning to take it into account. Professor Porter. I think my main feeling was that anything is technologically possible, providing we, we know the scientific background, which of course dates way back to Galileo. So you didn't feel surprised then? No, of course, I think or this wonder. is the main reaction, that there is no surprise. Oh, did you feel any sense of wonder? Great wonder, but one was wonder that one was seeing something which one had been waiting for since one was a little boy. Brian Aldis. Very much the same. I thought, at last we've made it. You know, man's one million years old. Uh, this is a very old dream indeed. At last, well, it's come true. The uh, neocortex that uh, powers us has finally realized this very old dream. And now we have these Ford T models down there on the moon and up again. Marvelous, but Professor, not unexpected. Professor Trevor Roper. I felt like Professor Porter. I can't say that I was surprised. Uh, there had been a build-up, one had expected it, and here it was at last. Uh, it was a, a new stage in human history, undoubtedly, and one was seeing it happening. One just watched. Do you feel, though, that the, the, the achievement, technical achievement, and the achievement in terrific sort of courage and uh, discipline, will make any difference to man's sense of unity on Earth or his sense of justice? No, frankly, I do not. No, I find I disagree with that very much because I think it's the first time that the human race has been able to see in its imagination where it actually lives and how small and how shining and how real it is and how vulnerable. And if it's true that we change nothing until we change our imagination, I think it's possible that this is the first step towards changing how we think about ourselves. How could, in a way, I suppose, one sees a baby and that's vulnerable enough. It's even more vulnerable than a shining orb in heaven, isn't it? That hasn't stopped us well, killing people. So. Uh, no, but the thing is, we're all on this orb and this orb is all we have. In other words, this is where everybody has got to make their life. That, that is more my feeling. But I think it will have a slight, uh, will have some effect eventually on, on man's sense of unity. Uh, firstly, uh, on the very slow, in the very slow process of feeling that there is something bigger outside our little world. But of course also, quite directly and immediately, yeah, through the satellite and the communication, the fact yeah. that we are 600 million people watching the same yeah, television yeah. program. This surely must make us feel closer. What difference will that make uh, about a sense of proximity? I mean, has television made people in the world feel that they have more in common, do you think? I would think when they have a common program, it has. And if one can communicate, when one, one meets people and one has seen the same television program, I think television is bringing people in England closer together, different kinds of persons. But if we all, if, Professor Trevor Roper, if, one all, if we all see I Love Lucy, does that do anything to our sense of each other's existence? I don't think it does. Uh, for centuries, there has been uh, a united Christendom. Let's say we've all thought that we believe the same things uh, about the structure of the world, the outer world, the, the universe. That didn't stop us during those years of Christian unity from all fighting each other all the time. I do not see why uh, the mere fact that we're all, as it were, watching the same play uh, should make us feel the same as each other. Well, not. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised yes. Professor uh, Trevor Roper thinks that we've had a united Christendom. I mean well, a united set of doctrines. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, surely the, the, the point is here that progress has been terribly slow and uncertain over this million years, and that uh, for every small Genghis Khan, Tamburlaine, Hitler, we have uh, very few Michelangelo's, Beethoven's, P.G. Woodhouse's to offer in exchange. The, the thing has been very uncertain, 
Now, however, we are there thanks to two basic eight characteristics, one of which is curiosity and the other of which is tribalism. Uh, whether this will develop into anything more, I don't know. I hope sincerely it will. But at the moment, I, uh, uh, among other things, all right, it's a great adventure, but it's also a, a triumph for big business, isn't it? Has the expansion of man, his desire to conquer the unknown and to combat himself against natural forces, necessarily allied itself in history with a, a more enlightened view of his dilemmas? Uh, but don't you think that we're talking about something a little different here? And that is, this is the first time in which human beings have had the sense of their planetary system as a single system of interdependence in which everybody can be involved in the same kind of disaster. In other words, the idea of getting away cheap, the idea of fighting a war and getting away with it, is, I think, contradicted not only by the picture of that glowing little orb which I come back to, this Earthrise, this, this little planet, but also our increasing knowledge of our ecosystems, the way that we can pollute the way in which nuclear, nuclear destruction drifts, the way in which all these things are carried by our physical organism. I maintain that that is made more clear by the vision from the moon, which is what we're talking about. Professor Trevor Roper, do you think that's true, or do you think that seeing the world like this creates a, a radical change in our imagination? I don't, I'm afraid. I can't follow it myself. Uh, I do not see why it should make any difference that for a century, two centuries, we have... Uh, uh, known, or we have assumed, that the uh, system of the universe uh, is uh, as it is now proved to be by our uh, by, uh, recent discoveries. Now, therefore, we are not surprised. We have all around this table stated that we were not really surprised when we yes. saw the men walking on the moon. We admired it, we were interested in it, we watched it entranced, but we were not surprised because we knew that the moon was roughly like that. We, we don't live in a Ptolemaic world in which we think that, the, uh, that our Earth is the centre of the universe. Uh, what has been proved has simply confirmed the cosmology of the last two centuries. We have not had a shock to our imagination which will cause us to think anew about our position in the universe. Do you think that, does anybody think that uh, the argument of Abernethy in the film we saw is a valid one, that uh, while going to the moon at the same time more should be done on Earth, or perhaps of the more extreme people, that it's a waste of money, vast sums of money, when there is misery, injustice and so on down here? Well, if I might begin, I would say, first of all, that compared with the resources available to the developed world, the amount being spent is very small indeed. It's perhaps about, it's less than 1% of America's gross national product, and as she grows by 3 to 4% a year, she's spent what she gets extra between Christmas and Easter. So don't let's get the idea that it's very big, it's very small. Uh, the appalling hemorrhage of waste is in the arms programs, which go up to 140 billions a year. So it's small. Where I think it could make a difference is whether, uh, rather as Dr. Thomas Paine was saying, if citizens will begin to say, if this kind of concentrated spending, planning and intelligence can produce something as good as this, then for heaven's sake you can make the traffic move. But and that kind of political change is a change in the way people imagine their own politics. But are they able to work imaginatively outside the brackets of, of facts? I mean, we know now that the, the men landing on the moon are the product of a strategic and prestige struggle between America and Russia. This is a military program that has caused and made this possible. But yeah. Yes, I think this business of whether they can work outside uh, uh, this um, accumulation of knowledge is, 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 is the crux of the matter. There is a time in scientific research, in technology, when money poured in produces yeah a profit or produces a, a, a result, a success. And I'm sure that if, um, as Lady Jackson has said, the money is really quite small, I'm sure that if an equally good case could be made that the technology is now available, the only thing needed is the money to solve this particular soci sociological problem, it would be provided. But why isn't it provided? But well, because which the case has not been made in general for the, the, a, a solution can be found which depends only on money. But I find myself a little in disagreement there, I must say, because we have also got in our market economies of the Western world the idea that this massive kind of concentrated spending, which depends upon government decision, which involves the private sector, but is government-directed, 
is confined pretty well to arms and to some extent education. We have not, in fact, made the decision for our city building, where most of the human race is going to live, that the city should command that kind of concentrated attention. Now, I would like to believe, and I do believe, that conceivably the success of this moon thing could produce this switch where people say, if you can do it for the moon, you can do it for New York. But why should that happen? I'm sorry, you haven't, you said you think it might, and you hope it will, but ha have you actually been able to give any evidence that it could, in well, view Tom of our knowledge of human nature and, and history? All I can say is that Thomas Paine begins to say it, and that's different from him not saying it. <laughs> Well, well c can we take an example of someone who has said this sort of thing? For instance, Herman Kahn and the Hudson Institute uh, produced a perfectly feasible plan for developing the Amazon Basin, which is a sort of large-scale project that we might well approve of. And this would uh, uh, provide great lakes within the uh, Amazon Basin, uh, by which means you would stop the Amazon flooding, you would open up the interior round the lakes for industry and agriculture, you would give the inland states in South America, such as uh, Bolivia and Paraguay, access to the sea, you would pr have enormous hydroelectric power, etc., etc. But it's not only a case of pouring in the money. Uh, for one thing, the Brazilians wouldn't like it because they, after all, have their own government and their own country to run. I think that this is different from the moon. The moon was one single target that could be solved through technology and big business. Uh, I think that if we're talking about sociological problems, as I think you are, Lady Jackson, then this is much more difficult because it involves larger areas of mankind. Is it possible that psychically, psychologically and spiritually, man will distract himself willingly from enormous problems about his whole life on Earth here, which are very critical at the moment, by flying into the stars? Is there any danger that this will take his I mind off problems which all of us ought to be trying to solve now? I, yes, I think, I think there's a danger of that. I, I think that the, the danger in particular is that technology will become enthroned as the new religion and that um, oh, it may yeah. w well be taking over now and that this tremendous triumph for technology may merely lead to a thirst for more technology. I think this is very dangerous. At the same time, we're a bit writing off the moon. All right, they, they're only now coming back, but it may be that this very day new sciences are born that um, will surprise us all and will indeed work towards the benefit of humanity. For instance, they put their little flag up to record the solar wind. Who knows what they, what they will find from that? Do you think that the world has suddenly been divided into a new kind of underdeveloped man, i.e. us sitting around this table, and a very small organized group of developed people, that is the Americans and the Russians? Well, they're oh, the no, only world. Well, no. No. no, they're surely the only <laughs> The Americans, world. we're grateful, very grateful to the Americans for providing the technology to do this. And we, I am participating in it and enjoying it as much as any American is. I am as interested in the results as anyone. Fifteen laboratories in Britain are hoping to get the, uh, some of the moon samples which are coming over. We're glad that they're doing it. It would be a complete waste of time for us to try to do the same thing. Complete waste of money too. Besides, it seems to me that uh, on both these questions, the great menace from technology and the great menace from the Russians and the Americans are their ridiculous arms race. I mean, a thing like MERV, you know, this multiple re-entry, whatever it is, which is going to have 20 nuclear bombs and 20 times overkill, where once we had to be content with eight. That's where the menace lies. And if, for heaven's sake, if the moon race and the exploration of the planets get some of these wild boys thinking not about blowing up this planet but about getting to other planets, then I say it's an enormous advantage, and it's the proper use of technology. I mean, that's my feeling. Yes, and I those are precisely w w the projects on which the money would be spent if it weren't spent on the... Am I not yeah. right in yeah. thinking, however, that, those, that, the, that the American space project, the moon project, was launched by President <laughs> Kennedy quite consciously and deliberately to get the better of the Russians? Yep. In the yes. same sense in which, in a more sinister way, you might say, arms were being accumulated by both sides, so space technology is accumulated. What is the difference? Well, it's the difference, perhaps, between having two knights running at each other in a tourney and saying, we will now settle who gets the estate, and everybody socking everybody. In other words, I think that this kind of competition 
uh, could be valuable, but I'm interrupting. Well, no worse than the World Cup. Yes. Well, one has to face the fact. The World Cup isn't played with an atomic bomb, I presume. But the, it, it has a national it has a national effort behind it nowadays. Uh, money is spent on training the athletes to do this, and it's a very harmless way compared with a war. Can we get back for a moment, Professor Trevor Roper, to the problem of the dis of the power involved in this achievement? Do you think there's any likelihood, Lady Jackson appears not to, that the world will have to accept an arrangement of power dictated by a very small group of people in the end with elite technocratic knowledge? I don't think it's a necessary consequence. I can see that it could happen, but uh, uh, it seems to me that these vast accumulations of technological power need an enormously widespread human base. And uh, it is at the base, not at the, uh, the summit of power, uh, that uh, a redistribution can take place. I, uh, Mr. Payne on the, uh, the program recently pointed, pointed this out when he pointed out that the uh, these enterprises, though uh, this particular one was centred in America, in fact draws on the talent of the world. But it only draws it, does it not, to Moscow or to Washington or to Florida. Can it dispense it the other way? In fact? But the people at the base remain human beings. And, uh, and I mean, is their relation to power that changes? That's what I'm asking. Their relation to power uh, may change. They may be enslaved by power. Quite. That is always a danger. On the other hand, the, uh, surely the real battle is to maintain people's humanity, to uh, stop people from coming, becoming robots. Mm -hmm. It's always possible that great technologi technological changes uh, will enslave people. It's, uh, I think, a 19th century illusion to suppose that all scientific uh, uh, progress is necessarily good. But what is your bet on this particular issue, I mean, in the next 50 years? I don't think one can bet. I think one, uh, uh, perpetual vigilance is the answer, not betting. Uh, but please, if I may say <laughs> quickly, uh, I meant that the danger of enslavement comes much more from technological weapons than from the moon race. In other words, don't, I was not saying there was no danger, but I think we're forgetting all the time that this vast technology is being used for utter destruction, mm. and the moon is not that. The moon is a relatively innocent branch yes, of yes. general mm. technological yes. change. But, yes. but, yes. but I, surely the point that you're trying to make there is that... Um, we may not be consulted. Yeah. And I believe that the, the point about the, the space race is that even the American public was not consulted. Uh, in fact, uh, President Kennedy invited his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, in, and they asked a few big business experts in and got cracking. There was no democratic process involved, as far as I can see. But, but Congress had to vote the money, so come. I mean, if Congress had really sensed an absolute groundswell of no, 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 uh, Congress would have been delighted to have, to have put a stop to President Kennedy before he died. You know, I mean, they were very against him. So I think you must not say it was not democratic unless you say Congress isn't. Well, well uh, <laughs> yes, but I, I would think that it was somewhat no. parallel to the Concord, where, you know, there was Could, no general consultation. Mm. I, I, I would court. like to take up a point to Professor Roper's because I think we're getting awfully confused between... The diff uh, between technology and science. Mm -hmm. Professor uh, Trevor Roper said that it had been shown in the 19th century, or he believed from the evidence of the 19th century, that all scientific pro progress was not necessarily good. I would debate that uh, to my dying breath, because science is knowledge, and I believe that the acquisition of knowledge must be good. Truth and knowledge must be good. The application of anything, whether it's knowledge uh, or, 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 or old technology, is, is something quite separate from yes, that I and can be bad. Uh, technological uh, rather than scientific. Yes, yeah. well, I think it's a very important oh, distinction yes. which must be made. It's a distinction which is a, a difficulty we're running in all the time in assessing this program. There is no scientific value at the moment in, in Apollo 11. I don't think anyone thinks so.